which is in accordance with the 12th of September 2003. We begin once again with our study of the monumental work Sharh al aqida al wasatiyah explained by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Saleh al-Uthaymain rahimahullah rahimahullah rahmatun wasi'ah uh, I had started thinking that maybe we should ask some questions. I'm, I'm, consor I'm concerned about the absorption of the knowledge. The absorption of the knowledge, and whether or not it's being absorbed, being digested. And this really is the most important factor, that when we sit in these type of circles, that we're not sitting for entertainment or sitting just to waste our time, but that we must achieve the aim, which is the acquisition of the knowledge so that we can carry the knowledge and we can act upon the knowledge and we can call to the knowledge this can't be done without some type of recall as to what has been studied there's various ways that people do that one of the ways is a test I recall in studying this book that we went over it thoroughly the mutton and the text of it and its explanation and then we had tests. We were tested to make sure that we understood the fundamental principles of the book. Because I mean, you know, it, you know, for our brothers to sit sometimes in these classes and maybe go on for months and hear you know, any lessons or whatever, and then they come away with almost nothing, this is uh, unacceptable really. I mean, some people take notes and depending, depending on their proficiency in taking notes, they, they have something beneficial in front of them. And some people just listen, uh, and, and it's fine if you have a good memory and you have a good recall, and at the same time you go over the tapes later on. This is something no one's finding fault with a brother who listens, and he does that. But if none of that is being done, then you really sort of are wasting your time, because knowledge, as it says, إنما العلم تعلم. إنما العلم تعلم. Knowledge is through learning. Doesn't come through osmosis. You're not just going to ab absorb throughout the atmosphere some knowledge. No, you have to strive. You have to strive. And knowledge is that which if you give some of all yourself to it, it will give some of itself to you. If you give all of yourself to it, it will give some of itself to you. Where we left off last was the life of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. And this is important from the standpoint of you need to know who is the author of a particular book and you need to know something about him and you should need to be able to recall something regarding him. You read a book by Ibn Taymiyyah, well who is this Ibn Taymiyyah? What do you know about his life? What do you know about the man? So it's important that some knowledge be gathered regarding him, some information be retrieved and recorded regarding him and also the explainer of the book which for us in this case is Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymain rahimahullah what do you know about him? what do you know about him? so we'll take briefly the last of the life of Ibn Taymiyyah because we took it before we took the, the people having uh, derision towards him and mistreating him we took the fact that he became an enemy of every muqtada, every innovator he became an enemy of. We took the fact that he gave da'wah night and day, that he suffered. We took the fact that the Tatar were there and the Tatar, the Mongols, were killing Muslims left and right. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah stood up to them, ordered them what was correct, not fearing the blame of the blamers and not fearing anything. We took that he would order what is good and forbid what is bad, that he responded to every group in accordance with what they were needed to be responded to. He responded to the Christians with his monumental book, Al Jawab al Sahih, Liman Badal al Deen al Masih, the correct response to those who correct, corrupted the Deen of the Messiah. He responded to the Jews. He responded to the Sufis. He responded to Al Sha'ira. He responded to the Jahmiya. He responded to the Maturidiyya. He responded to the Batiniya. He responded to the Qadariya. He responded to the Jahmiya. He responded to the Mu'tazila. He responded to the Karamiya. He responded to the Karamita. He responded to everybody who was in fact on some type of innovation. 
Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, dealt with them, subdued them, and conquered them. And so it's important to understand this, why he's Sheikh al-Islam, why he is, in fact, Sheikh al-Islam. Talked about him even getting thrown in jail for his viewpoint regarding the three talaks. Because everybody was on the, on, the, on the opinion that if you pronounced the three talaks, then that was it. And of course, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said it didn't matter how many times you pronounced it, in a general sense, this was his fatwa, but that there was, it was counted in one jalsa, one sitting as one talaq. It was counted as one talaq. So he was thrown in prison for this, brothers. He was thrown in prison for this fatwa because it went against the general flow. It went against the general society. It went against what the people were generally up on. And so therefore he was thrown in prison. He was thrown in prison because of that. The question of the three talaq. Yeah, and the issue was whether a divorce pronounced three times at the same time took legal effect or not. This issue raised the following considerations. And, uh, and he goes on to the, the reasons behind it and, and, and the considerations in that. But Ibn Taymiyyah, and he was thrown in prison because of this. And a royal edict was issued in Cairo, 718 Hijri, 1381 Christian era, forbidding him from giving any more fatawa. Can you imagine that a Qur'an comes down and he's told that he can't give any more fatawa because of this? It's initially Ibn Taymiyyah abided by the edict, but later on he began giving fatwas anyway. And then it was told that he should desist or fear the government. Then he was detained in the citadel. The citadel was a prison, Qala. It's a prison, a well-known prison. Even to this day you can see this prison in Syria for his fatawa and his legal burdens. He was placed in there for five months. Until he was, he was released uh, later, from orders, uh, order, or been ordered from Cairo to be released. Five months in a prison cell. And the prison cells then were not like they are now. Just like everything today is not like it was then. And it's a hermit's hole or less than that. It was in fact a prison. It's in fact a prison. And he dealt with that. For well, this particular fatwa he gave regarding what? Whether or not divorce pronounced three times in one sitting took place or not. This shows the jealousy that was present. It shows the evil ulama, the evil so-called ulama who are around him, who wanted his harm, who wanted that he be destroyed, who wanted that he be removed, who wanted that he be humiliated. Bismillah. The final years. Between 721 after Hijra and 726 after Hijra, Ibn Taymiyyah devoted himself to teaching in Madrasa Hanbaliya and his own Madrasa, Qassasin, and revising some of his earlier works. His adversaries again conspired to have him imprisoned. Here he continued writing tafsir of the Quran, as well as other works. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, died in jail in Damascus on the Sunday or Monday of the 20th of Dhul Qa'da in the year 728 Hijri, 26 27 September 1328, at the age of 67. He's buried in the cemetery of the, of the Sufiya in Damascus. Even though Ibn Taymiyyah Allah called against shirk in order with Tawheed, the Sufis have a tendency still to visit his grave. Can you imagine that? Someone who has, a, who has an abhorrent, appalling position regarding that whole thing, they had audacity to do that. He died in prison, brothers. This was his juhd, his striving, his amount of sincerity to Allah Ta'ala, that all of his life was spent in the worship of Allah Ta'ala, or acquiring knowledge regarding Allah Ta'ala, or and he defending the sunnah, and exposing and deflecting the bid'ah, calling to tawheed, and warning against shirk. All his life being spent like this, acquisition of knowledge, and then acting on the knowledge and calling people to that knowledge and spreading that knowledge until such time he sacrificed to such degree where he died in prison. He died in the sijin. When they placed him in the sijin, Ibn Taymiyyah Allah recited the ayah which states that behind it is punishment and inside of it is mercy. Behind it and outside of the wall is punishment, and inside of it is mercy. 
He recited this. And Ibn Taymiyyah likes to say, ma, ma the yasna adui bi, or whatever my enemy does with me, ana bustami fi sadri, my garden is in my chest. My garden is in my chest. Whichever way I go is with me. If they kick me out within the land, then this is like what going on a journey to, to, to tourism to view things and to see things that are, that are unique. That's how he's seen it. Kicking him out, meaning that you was giving him time to observe the create, cre creation of Allah Taala and see the beauty and the richness of the creation of Allah Taala. You, you're sending me on a tour and imprisoning me was is khalwa. Imprisoning me is khalwa. The time that I have to be alone with my Lord and remember my Lord and submit to my Lord and pray to my Lord. That's how he viewed it. They would get letters from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, his brothers and his students. And these letters, would, when he would say, they say, how you doing? He said, ana fi ni'matin azim. I'm in a great blessing that I'm not able to calculate nor am I able to articulate the full input of it to you. For this is one of the greatest blessings that Allah Taala has placed upon me that He has placed me in this matter. That He has placed me in this circumstance. And each letter, if you read it, is much more fatawa. Each letter was like that. I'm in the netma, man. I'm in netma. I'm in good situation. Good condition. What Allah Taala has given me here, I mean, is, is beyond belief. What I have learned, what I've experienced, what, 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 what I have obtained of, 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 of comfort and of serenity and of peace and of the sweetness of Iman and of reflection on Ar-Rahman and all of these matters, I could, it could not be compared to anything. And this is how his letters were constantly from a prison, from a hole in, uh, hidden in the side of a hole in darkness. But this is how he was. Shaykh al-Salaam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. No doubt his character and his achievements are great. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah says that the difference between us and them, and he, us being Ahl al-Sunnah and them being Ahl al-Bidah, is Yom al-Jana'is, the day of the funerals. We'll see you the day of the funerals. This will be the difference. Because the funerals of Ahl al-Sunnah, those of Ahl al-Hadith, those who Allah Taala has written for them qubul or acceptance throughout the earth, everybody comes. Some riding animals, some walking on their feet. All miles and miles around they come for this purpose. And so this is why he said the day of Jannah is. The day of Jannah is. Because Ahl al bidah are usually isolated by themselves. Alone. Alayka salam. No one's concerned about them. They live despicable and they die despicable. They lived away from the Sharia and they die away from the Sharia. So Ibn Taymiyyah Allah has said that the people of Damascus who held him in great honor gave him a splendid funeral and estimated 200,000 men. 200,000 men and 15,000 women attended his funeral. He was buried, like we said, at that particular cemetery in Damascus where his mother was buried. His name is Sufiya. 200,000 men. And this is why Imam Ahmad said, between us and you is Janazah. They won't know who's upon the haq and who's upon the bata. They won't know who's correct and who's not. Yom Janazah is. And this is Imam Ahmad's funeral was bigger than that, millions. And hundreds of thousands became Muslims, converted to Islam on that day. Why, it was a glorious day. People came into Islam. People left Bidah and came into Sunnah. On, his, on the day of Imam Ahmad's funeral. Character and achievement of Taymi occupied a highly honorable place among his contemporary religious scholars. Due to his prodigious memory, he had a great memory. Brilliant intelligence. Encyclopedia knowledge. We, we took that. Dauntless courage. He's described as a great orator, brave and fearless, resolute and disciplined, very pious, resigned and content, contented. I think he means contented. Noble and forgiving, just and ever determined. Just and ever determined. 
Ibn Taymiyyah reformed, had, he had reform, reformative endeavors, and literary pursuits that covered a vast field, which can be summarized as follows. One, revival of the faith. This is what he wanted to do. He wanted to revive Islam. He wanted to revive Iman. He wanted to revive the deen. An inherence, a strict adherence to Tawheed, a strict and clear cut, no compromising, no gray area, black and white, adherence, adherence to Tawheed, eradication of all false beliefs and customs, criticism of the philosophers and all of those who were trying to say something was superior to the Quran and the Sunnah, removing the un-Islamic beliefs by going against the Christians and going against the Jews in his books and his works and verbally and going against the Shia and going against the Bataniya and going against all aspects of Ahl al Rejuvenation of Islamic thought and related sciences giving rebirth to Tafsir rebirth to Asura Tafsir rebirth to Asura Fiqh rebirth to Fiqh rebirth to Asura Hadith rebirth to Hadith rebirth to the Ilm, ilm al-Nasa wal mansur rebirth to all of those issues Rejuvenation of the Islamic sciences, so they became alive again after the once being considered something that was dead or rusted over or no one gave concern to. Ibn Taymiyyah brought back to life. Brought back to life. Total workings of Ibn Taymiyyah that are known, because as many that aren't, is 621. Many of them have been lost. Al Jawab al Sahih, the Imam Badal al Masih. An answer to the criticism against the Christians. It's actually al jawab al sahih the correct response, liman badala deen al-Masih, for the one who corrupted the deen of the Messiah. They corrupted the deen of Isa alayhi salam. They're not on the deen of Isa alayhi salam. They don't know the deen of Isa alayhi salam. They can't find the deen of Isa alayhi salam except in Islam. He wrote against them. Rad ala mantaqiyin, those who are upon mantaq and logic, we have many of those today, and like this. This is basically Ibn Qaymiyyah and we have not given him his just due in this matter, but this dars is aqeedah wa thatiyah, not the life of Ibn Taymiyyah, not a series of that. But just enough to know about him, so that you have the respect that you are, that you are to have regarding such a man, such a unique, righteous, strong, courageous individual. We need the likes of him in our time. We need the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah in our time. Now, the explainer of this book, before we get, go directly to it, is Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Saleh al Uthaymain. And he is Abu Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Salih, ibn Muhammad ibn Uthaymain al-Tamimi. And al-Tamimi is a tribe, well-known tribe. Amongst them are those who went the way of the Khawarij, following the Khawaisira. And amongst them are those who are the most righteous of people and scholars. To such degree that the Prophet said, Banu Tamim, the tribe of Tamim, they are the hardest people among, uh, uh, towards the Jajal. They are the hardest people upon the Dajjal. So this is, he is a Tamimi, a Najdi. He was born in the city of Uneza, Qasim, the Qasim region, on the 27th of Ramadan. He was born in the month of Ramadan. 1926, Christian era, 1347 Hijri. In a famous religious family. Didn't we say this before? That things don't just come out the blue. Ibn Taymiyyah was born in a deen-oriented, scholarly family, and the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah come out of that. Ibn Taymiyyah was born in a religious, deen-oriented family, and the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah comes out of that. It is a rare thing indeed that someone who has no surrounding that is Islamic, and no family that is Islamic, that they will come out to that level of Ibn Taymiyyah. They may come out in a good level, no one's saying they won't. Allah took Ta'ala blesses who he wills. But we're saying to that level, when you look at to that level, to that degree, those people usually came out of generations. Generations of Islamic scholarship huh, pops up Ibn Taymiyyah. 
Generations of taqwa, here comes Ibn Taymiyyah. Generations of fiqh, generations of hadith, here comes Muhammad al-Wahhab, rahimahullah. Here comes Shafi'a. Come out of that situation. So if there's anything a brother wants to do, is to make sure his family's straight now. His family's straight, and the generations are straight now, and the children are straight now, and everybody, everybody's up on Ta'eed and Sunnah now, and everybody is on the acquisition of Islamic knowledge now. Then a generation and a generation or two, then we have something to look at. We say, look what this tree has harvested. Look what this tree has borne. Look what has been given birth to, based on the fact that we kept the covenant. We were, we kept the, 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 the pact, and that is to be solely committed to Allah Ta'ala and ascribe nothing to Him. Ibn, uh, Ibn Uthaymain Allah, received his education from many prominent scholars, like Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Sa'di, who is one of his main scholars he studied with, Sheikh Muhammad Amin al Shanqiti, and of course Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz. Sheikh Sa'di, the Rahman al Sa'di, Sheikh Shanqiti, the old Shanqiti, not the present day. The old Shanqiti was on something. Present day one got some problems. Oh, Shankiti had, a, had a, a vast amount of knowledge. And Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz. Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz. Bin Baz is one of your sheikh, you all right. Bin Baz is one of your sheikh, you got it. When he entered into teaching a great number of students from inside and outside Saudi Arabia, benefited from him. He had his own unique style of interpretation. You'll see that as we go you'll start to get appreciation of how Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Uthaymeen presents issues and how he discusses them. He has his own way, unique to him, to the degree that if you become so familiar with them, no one has to tell you his name when they read a portion of anything he's done. You'll hear it and you'll say, that's Ibn Uthaymeen. That's who that is. That's Ibn Uthaymeen. Uh -huh. So everyone started to benefit from him inside and outside of Saudia inside and outside of Saudi and as you see we're sitting here still benefiting man in his grave and we still benefiting and this is for him a sadaqa al jariya a continuous sadaqa adds to him light in his grave and bliss in his existence and mercy and peace and serenity adds to us knowledge insha'Allah ta'ala and enlightenment of tawheed some knowledge regarding sunnah and the foundation and the basis of our aqidah now that's a pretty good transaction. That's a pretty good transaction. Unique style of interpretation, explanation of religious point. He was from among the scholars who served this line without any type of religious prejudice and kept themselves away from the limitations of blind following. In other words, he didn't do taklid. He knew nothing about no taklid, blind following. Blind follow who? Okay, tell us something. I'm going to have to man. Blind follow what? It was his way. He was distinguished in his great exertion of effort in religious matters and illogical deductions and yeah, his chaos or something else, which clearly proved, pr clearly proved the religious understanding he possessed and his correct usage of the principles of religion. He knew the Kauai. He knew the Kauai, the principles of Deen. And therefore, he was able to base things upon those principles and make points upon those principles and give fatawa upon those principles. And so his thing, when he came, when he came at you, it was strong. It was strong. One of them described him, and this was a guy who didn't like him initially. I found him fully armed, well protected, and strong. I found him fully armed, I did that with evidences. No matter what I brought to him, he brought something back. That had me relenting, or subdued me, or did away with me. Huh? You go check cave high, the wakada, wakada, wakada. What about this, this, and this? Wakada, wakada, wakada. And this, this, and this. Just like that. The man was a brown skin, light brown skin. We used to look at his face and we would see this white beard with this, the shiniest pearl teeth you would ever want to see. Constantly smiling. This was even thing mean. Something else. He was distinguished in the great exertion of effort in religious matters. And we did, we said that. In giving religious verdicts like Sheikh bin Baz, 
His fatawa were based on evidence from Quran and Sunnah. He had about 50 compilations, books to his credit. He taught religious fundamentals at the Sharia. He taught usul at the faculty of Imam Muhammad ibn Sa'ud Sa Islamic University, the Qasim branch. He was also a member of the Council of Senior Scholars, Hayat al Kibar al Ulama, of the kingdom. And he was an Imam and a Khatib in the big masjid of Unaiza. How are you going to do all this, man? Teaching to love, giving fatawa, sitting on, leg on the legend of the Daima, or are they sitting on the Hayat al Kibar al Ulama? Then you still going to get up there and give khutbah and, lead, and, and be Imam at a particular masjid? Where was their energy? How? The Sheikh passed away, as you all know, the 15th of Shawal, 1421 after Hijrah. It was January, the 10th of January, 2001. He was 74 years of age. May Allah SWT have mercy upon his soul. I mean, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Thaymain, given to you in a abridged form of which you cannot probably even abridge it any more than that concisely. Now, there's a statement I want to read before we go and start. Christ said, man, why you, you, come on, man. Come on, let's get to it. I can look at the size of this book. This is what we're talking about going here. I went through a book this size, with Jamaica the Quran, so that took us two years. So anybody want to lead, lead now. <laughs> yeah. But to me, it's, it's, it's you learn through gradation, taking it step by step. And therefore, each step along the way, you're going to learn something. ta'ala That you did not know or be reminded something that you might have forgotten. Uh, so let's not be in a rush. Now, Sa'adi, rahimullah, makes a statement about Aqeedah that I, I think is important that we pay attention to. This is a book by Sa'adi, who is the sheikh of Ibn Thaymain, his main sheikh. A book called Fatah al-Rahim al-Malak al-Allam Fi ilm al-Qa'il wa al-Tawhi wa akhlaq wa al-Ahkam al-Mustabit al-Min al-Quran He says in it about Tawhi He says, هذا هو أشرف معلوم or علوم It is the most noble of knowledges What is? Tawhi And you know they often used to say it like this It is the most noble of knowledges because every knowledge nobility is taken from what is connected to and since Tawheed is connected to Allah, then that makes it what? The most noble of knowledges. You got that point? May I ask you again, Abdul Qayyum? Any knowledge is to be assessed based upon what it is connected to. Knowledge of any of mechanics is connected to a car. Right? Knowledge of physics is connected to what it is connected to, and like this. So a knowledge that is connected to Allah has to definitely be a noble knowledge because there's no one more nobler than Allah Ta'ala. Absolutely. The best knowledge. The knowledge of Tawheed. The most perfect. With it their hearts are made straight. Upon the correct belief. And with it the morals and man's behavior are purified and they are given nourishment and growth. This is what Aqeed is supposed to do, brothers. I mean, he's not whistling Dixie here. He's talking about something that actually is supposed to take place when we study Tawheed. That it is the afdaluha, the best knowledge, absolutely. Wa the most perfect knowledge. Wa bihi tastaqim al With it, the hearts become straight, brother. If there's deviation in the heart, Tawheed will straighten it out. If there's any crookedness in the heart, Tawheed will straighten it out. If there's anything that needs to be mended in the heart, Tawheed will mend it. Tastaqim al The hearts will be straightened out. Ala aqaid al-sahiha. Upon the correct beliefs. Upon the correct beliefs. Wa bihi tasqul akhlaq wa tammu. And with it, the morals and manners and behavior. Our morals are purified and they are nourished. Huh. This is what supposed to happen. Supposed to, without an SU. Supposed to happen. This is what is supposed to happen. 
And through this correct ta'id and knowledge and aqeedah, actions become valid or invalid. To sih al-a'man, you want your actions to be correct, you've got to have ta'id and correct aqeedah. What talk about, and your actions will be made complete and perfect based upon that. So this is what he wanted to say. He talks about what this knowledge deals with. That this knowledge, al-bah, researches or deal with what is obligatory regarding Allah. From the obligatory qualities of Allah's perfection and His, and his uh, beautiful descriptions. And that which is forbidden regarding Allah, meaning of qualities of deficiency. And things that, that are deficient and, and are quality that don't befit Allah. And like this. And what is permissible regarding Allah to him bringing into existence all that he has brought into existence. Al-fa'alu lima yurid. He does what he wants. Ma sha'akan wa ma lam yasha'alam yakun. What he wills will be and what he does not will will not be. Also deals with belief in the messengers and their qualities. What is permitted for the messenger to do and what is not permissible for him to do. Belief in the books. To the end of what he said of jaza, the last day, uh, the reward, the punishment, the jannah and the this is just something to tell you what aqeedah is supposed to do. What we're supposed to be getting out of this lesson. Don't say your aqeedah is sound and then you're morally corrupt. Because you haven't studied aqeedah properly then. Don't say that your aqeedah is sound but your heart is deficient and crooked and hard. Because then you haven't studied aqeedah really. Because we, we just understood from the statement of Sa'di that this is supposed to correct us. This is supposed to rectify us. You want rectification? Sit in a circle studying Aqeedah. You want rectification? Sit in a circle studying Aqeedah. Man, you know I'm pretty good but I lie a lot. Sit in a circle studying Aqeedah. I'm trying to be on what I'm supposed to be about but I, you know, I cheat. I tend to cheat. I tend, I tend to keep people's trust. I don't give them back when they give me stuff. Sit in the circle on Aqeedah. If the aqidah is sound, everything else will be what? Sound. We talked about this before. We said every container gives what it contains. The container of vinegar will only give vinegar. You can do all you want. That container that has vinegar in it is only going to give you vinegar. And the container that contains honey is only going to give you honey. So we have to make sure that our receptacles, that which we have, our hearts, contain the correct aqidah, sound knowledge regarding Allah Ta'ala, based upon a sound foundation, and what will come from us, and what we will be able to convey to others, will be that which is sound, and that which is correct, and that which is righteousness, and that which is in accordance with what Allah Ta'ala and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has called to and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were up on. Now, the little time we have, we'll start. He opens with the, the page with Fas'alu ahli dhikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. Ask the people of remembrance. The people who have knowledge of Quran or Sunnah and al Salah, the scholars, if you don't know. Then he does his own intro, which we'll leave. Then we'll do the intro that the Sheikh has. Sheikh uh, Muhammad Sari Uthaymeen rahimahullah starts with this intro. And this intro is composed, this introduction is composed of some basic knowledge of Tawheed. Why? Because uh, something came to my mind. One of the brothers said to me, hey, you know, you know, man, if you gave, gave most of our brothers a pop quiz, man, about Tawheed, they couldn't pass it, man. He said, man, you should, like, give them a pop quiz. I said, no, I don't want to put nobody on front street, man. Give them a pop quiz, man. Go ahead, pop them. Pop them with a quiz, right? That was his mentality. And he saying that our brothers wouldn't know the three aspects of Tawheed even. I can't believe that. I refuse to believe that. But nevertheless, now... The three aspects of Tawheed, which are known, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Ruhiyya, Tawheed Asma al-Sifat. This book mainly deals with Asma wa sifat The names and qualities of Allah, of Allah Tawheed al-Qutala. And it's going to cover Tawheed al-Rububiyya, the oneness of Allah and His Lordship, and Tawheed al-Ruhiyya, oneness of Allah and the fact that He alone should be worshipped. 
It's going to cover it in general and in, in inclusive in what it says and as a direct result of what it'll bring. In other words, there's no way you can get around it because all of them are intertwined. But Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al sifat these are the three aspects of Tawheed that if one comes with, he is a Mawahid, somebody up on Tawheed, and he will be successful. But if he is deficient or misses one of them, he will not be on the correct belief and he will in fact be amongst the losers. All of them have to be there. So if it sounds to you, if this is the first time you've sat in a circle of this nature, this is the first time that you've been blessed by Allah Ta'ala to hear for the first time these pearls of wisdom, these, these, these diamonds, these jewels of Tawheed, of what is Tawheed and the belief of Allah Ta'ala, and some of it sounds a little foreign to you, get used to it. It will, inshallah Ta'ala, with time, it will find its way into soaking into your heart, into your mind, and you will get past the illusion of the words being hard, because that's all it is. They're very easy to memorize, and you'll find that this is a very sound and easy, not difficult aqidah to understand. It's not hieroglyphics. It's not nuclear science. It doesn't need any of that. It's in accordance with the fitrah, but we have to give some effort to it. We have to get some effort. Since this deals mainly with Tawheed al asma wa Sifat, the names of Allah, the oneness of Allah and His names and His qualities, then the Sheikh has to cover the other aspects of Tawheed in his intro. So that it be understood that this is also important. And this treatise, even though it deals with Tawheed al asma wa Sifat, it deals with basically the aqidah in general. The aqidah in general, everything that the Muslims are supposed to believe in, this particular aqidah, aqidah wasatiyah, explains it. Mukhtasiran in our bridge for where this is what you're supposed to be. You want to know what it is to be Muslim? You want to know what it is to be Sunni? You want to know what it is to be Salafi? You want to know what it is to be Adhari? Somebody up on that which is correct, this is the belief that you have to have. He says, at the same Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa salatu salam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in amma ba'd fa inna hadha al-kitab ladhi yusamma this book which is called Al-Aqidah al-Wasatiyya allafahu habra ummah fi zamanah it is written by habra ummah habr is somebody who is an ocean of knowledge because if you look at it habara is on the same form as bahara Bahara is a bahar, ocean. An ocean. So Habr is someone who is an ocean of knowledge. And he calls him the ocean of knowledge of this Ummah. Who is he talking about? Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah. Allah for Habr Ummah fi zamanah. The oceans of, the possessor of oceans of knowledge in his time. In his time. Ibn Taymiyyah, because, you know, this is a name given to Ibn Abbas. Right? Habra Ummah Ibn Abbas, right? Tajumanu Quran. Abu Abbas! I was going to ask you his name in this kunya. We'll do that next time. I'll get you, inshallah. Abu Abbas! Shaykh al-Islam! Ahmad ibn Abdul Halim! Ibn Abdul Salam! Ibn Taymiyyah al-Harani! Rahimullah! Who died in 728. It's important sometimes, not so many, not necessarily the birth date, but the death date. Keep in your mind these things. This is what uh, they often teach the students of knowledge. To remember the death date of a particular scholar. So 728 Hijri. This man had so many great circumstances and positions and levels that he went through throughout his life. Maqamat is things that happened to him. Events that took place with him. Huh? That which he should be thanked for. And that we hope from Allah that He rewarded for. Because of His defense of the truth. And attacking Ahlul Batil, the people falsehood. Anybody will know this who reads his books and has patience regarding reading his books and going through them. You come to know the worth of the man. You come to know his value. You come to know something about his level. Well, hakikah and the reality. Anahu min ni'ma Allahi ala hadi ummah. 
Ibn Tamim says, in reality, is that this man is from the blessings of Allah upon this ummah. No one knows the virtues of the virtues except those who are virtuous. Takes a scholar to recognize what he's saying. Ibn Tamim, by virtue that he's Ibn Tamim, with the knowledge he had, is able to look at Ibn Tamim and say, in reality, in reality, he's of the blessing of Allah Allah has the ummah upon this ummah uh, who wants to doubt that who wants to contradict that and still remain in this circle who this book this man's books right now defend Islam right now his books defend Islam right now there's some scholars sitting in some room or some student of knowledge taking from the resources and the pearls of wisdom that Ibn Taymiyyah did. Right now, Sheikh Rabi is putting in one of his books. Omar Sanabad is putting in one of his books. Some type of statement from Ibn Taymiyyah. Right now, someone's doing a bath and an issue of fit, and they're looking at what Ibn Taymiyyah said. Hakeza, Hakeza, like this. He is from the ni'mah of Allah, from this ummah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kaffa bihu muradiba. Because Allah protected this ummah from great dangers. Protected this ummah from great dangers, particularly in the area of Aqidah with this man. This man was the protector of the Aqidah. This man was the defender of the Aqidah. This man was the maintainer of calling to that which is sound regarding the Aqidah. Great dangers the Muslims' religion and their beliefs were being exposed. Innovations were being innovated. And Ibn Taymiyyah was chopping away. And Ibn Taymiyyah was chopping away. Wahadha Kitab, this book, Kitab Mukhtasar, a bridge to summarize, short book. You some that called Al Aqidah, the Aqidah, Al Wasitiyah. It was written by Sheikh al Islam because a man or a judge came to him from Wasit, a judge, a Qabi came to him from the city of Wasit. Shaka huh? alayhi, complained to him, ma kana nas yu'ainunahum min al-madahib al-munharifa, what the people are experiencing from deviant beliefs, particularly regarding the names and qualities of Allah. فَقَتَبَ هَذِي عَقِيدَةِ He wrote this belief. Hey, read it, uh, read the belief. How a man gonna just sit down and write that? They say the same thing about Zata al-Hamawiyah. He wrote it right after Asa, you know. I mean, I'll write it to you. After. And I'm kind of busy, but yani. Write it out. Khalas, Huh? Wrote it for the man on the spot. A book that's studied now for centuries. A book that has graduate doctorate theses being done on it. A book that has been explained by all the great ulama of Nest and, and, er, and every scholar from the Salafi way basically has explained to someone and wrote different and has studied it and had brought it in different ways. We went to the Aqidah of Wasatiya explained by Khalil Hiras, the Sheikh of Muhammad Amman al -Jami. Went to Tanbihat al Sunniya, which is one done by one of the Qadis of Mecca, explaining what? Aqidah Wasatiya. And like this, then some of them do it in As'ila wa Ajwiba form, question and answer form. Right? Some of them do it like that. This is something this man wrote. From his ilm, Ani, and from his, his, his concern of the ummah. None. فَكَتَبَ هَذِي عَقِيدَةِ He wrote this belief. أَلَّتِي تُعَدُّ زُبْدَ لِعَقِيدَةِ أَحْلَ السُّنُ وَجَمَاءِ It is considered the butter of the عَقِيدَةِ أَحْلَ السُّنُ وَجَمَاءِ In what? يَتَعَلَّقْ بِالْأُمُورِ the matters that he khad al nasafiya or that the people went into from bid'ah wa kathara fiha kalam and they had a lot of talk about wa khil wa qal he said and she said qabla an nabda kalam ala hadhihi rasala before we talk about this great risala ibn uthaymin says huh? he says risala adhima nahib an nubayyin we like to explain that jami' risalat al rusul that every message of the messengers, from the first of them, being Nuh alayhi salam, 
إلى آخره لا يحسدهم بمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم كلها تدعو إلى التوحيد All of them called to Tawheed mainly, mainly So he wants to cover all of it قال الله تعالى You heard it again and you're going to hear it again inshallah قال الله تعالى You heard it before you're going to hear it again وما أصلنا من قبلك من رسولا إلا نوحي إليه أنه لا إله إلا أنا فاعبدون And we have not sent a messenger except that we reveal to him that none has the right to be worshipped except I didn't worship me. Al Anbiya, verse 25. وقال تعالى, Allah the Exalted said, وَلَكَدْ بَأَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا And then we have sent in every nation a messenger. أن اعبدوا الله That you worship Allah. وَاشْتَنِبُوا التَّاغُوتِ And that you avoid all false deities. You avoid all ta'ghut, all things that are worshipped besides Allah. And they're pleased with that worship. Al-Nahad verse 36. وَذَلِكَ And we'll end with this before he gets to the end of here. ذَلِكَ إِنَا خَلَقْ خَلِقُوا لِوَاحِدِ That is called the creation was created for one purpose. And for one. And that is Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. خَلِقُوا لِإِبَارَتِهِ Created for his worship. تَتَعَلِقُ لُبُهُمْ بِهِ Their hearts ought to be attached to him. Glorifying him. Realizing his majesty. خوف and fear in him. Raja and having trust in him. Tawakkal and depending upon him. Rakbat and desiring him. Warahbat and fearing him. Hatta yansalakhu an kulli shayim in the dunya. Until they remove themselves from everything of the dunya. That is not a help for them upon this tawheed. Until they remove themselves from anything connected to this dunya. In salakh. It's like the snake coming out of his skin. And they take off that skin. Take off anything from the dunya that doesn't help them with this tawheed. Doesn't help them fulfill this tawheed. Doesn't help them exemplify this tawheed. Doesn't help them with tawheed of Allah. Azza wa Jal. لَنَّكَ أَنْتَ مَخْلُوقٍ Because you're created. لَا بُونَ تَكُونَ لَهَا خَالِقٍ You must have a creator. قَلْبًا وَقَالِبًا فِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ In every situation, in every matter, this is the case. وَلِهَانَ Because of this, كَانَ دَعْتُ رُسُّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ The call of all the messengers, إِلَى هَذَا الْأَمْرُ To this matter, الْحَامْ عَذِيمِ This great important matter. إِبَارْتِ اللَّهِ The worship of Allah, وَحْدَهُ Alone, لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ Without any associate. لم يكن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بشر يدعون إلى توحيد الربوبية. Those who the messenger Allah sent as messengers didn't call to the oneness of Allah and His Lordship. Though that's part of their da'wa. That was not their call. But they, uh, if they called to it, they didn't call to it like they called to the oneness of Allah in His worship. Because those who deny the oneness of Allah and His Lordship are very far, few in between. Uh, and even those who refuse it, in reality inside they believe in it and they can't deny it. Unless there's someone who don't have their uqu, their intelligence, and don't have any perception whatsoever, then they are, other than that, denying it from arrogance. قَدْ قَسَمَ أُولَمَا رَحِمُ اللَّهِ تَوْحِيدَ الْحَذَرَةَ أَقْسَامِ The ulama say tawheed is in three branches. Then he talks about tawheed al-rububiyya, and tawheed al-uluhiyya, and tawheed al-asma wa sifat, which we will deal with next time, بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى